Administrative Assistant for Faculty Initiatives at the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. Welcome to today's webinar. Please review the disclosures on your screen, and I'll go over a few things before we get started. First, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box on your screen. Content-specific questions will be answered following the presentation as time allows. The session will be recorded and will be available on the AACN website under on-demand webinars. At the end of the session, you will be given access to a program evaluation. It will also be sent to you in a follow-up email. It is now my pleasure to kick off today's webinar, CCNE Accreditation, Standard 3, Program Quality, Curriculum, and Teaching Learning Practices. At this time, I'll pass the presentation over to the Director of Accreditation Services, Lori Schrader. Lori? Thank you, Sean. Um, before we jump right in, I just want to make a few of my own notes. In addition to the location that Sean mentioned, the webinar would be archived. It will also be archived on the CCNE website, so you can find it in two places. Um, so that's the good news. Also, uh, we will do our best to answer any questions that are submitted in writing, um, in writing, but also if we see a cluster of questions that are similar to one another, we will try to work those into our discussion because that, that lets us know that um, in, there are numerous individuals who are interested in the same information. So just wanted to set the stage for that. I now have the pleasure of introducing to you today's presenters. We have Dr. Deborah Davis, um, who I'm just going to share with you the fabulous, fabulous experience she has with CCNE, um, and that is she is a past member of the Board of Commissioners, um, and in that time on the board, she served two full terms. She served as vice chair. She is also a past member of the Report Review Committee, where she also served as a co-chair. And she most recently served as co-chair of the Standards Committee and serves as a team leader for CCNE. Um, I also have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Christine Pastini. She is a current member of the Board of Commissioners, a current member of the Accreditation Review Committee, and will be serving as co-chair of that committee in the upcoming year. She was a member of the most current standards committee and when she's not on the board, also serves in a team leader role for CCNE. So as you can all um, see, we have wonderful expertise to present this webinar today. So our outcomes for the, the day are pretty simple. We are hoping that you'll develop an understanding of standard three in the revised standards that you'll learn about CCNE's expectations in regard to the standard three and the key elements that fall under it and the different ways you might present evidence to demonstrate compliance. And of course, we'll be providing information about when the new standards go into effect and what resources are available to our constituents. So for those of you that may be participating in all four webinars, um, you're going to notice that the next few slides look familiar, but we could not make any assumptions about people's availability or interest in all four webinars. So we've gone ahead and provided some baseline information, if you will, to provide a frame of reference for participants. So I'm just gonna quickly go through those slides and I apologize to those of you who may be uh, hearing this information for the third time. So as you know, or I hope you know, CCNE has been celebrating its 20th anniversary this entire year. And we just wanted to draw to your attention the support that we've had over these last 20 years and how we've grown from being a brand new accreditor to currently accrediting nearly 1,800 programs at over 800 institutions. And you can see the breakdown of that. Uh, just a little bit of information about the standards. The structure of them has not changed. So when you open your brand new printed copy of the 2018 standards later this fall, you'll see that they look very similar to the 2013 standards. They're still organized with four standards and key elements under each of those standards with elaboration statements. There's a list of supporting documentation at the end of each standard and at the end of the standards document, there is a glossary. So no changes there. 
here's the information that I know most of you have been waiting for. Um, so if I had a drum roll, I would provide that. Um, the first is that the new standards, the 2018 standards, are going to be going into effect for all programs on January 1st, 2019. So what that means, if your program is hosting an on-site evaluation or submitting a report to CCNE on or after January 1st, 2019, your program is going to be addressing the new standard. Okay, so what can you look for now that might help you as you make the transition from the 2013 standards to the 2018 standards? Well, first, we've developed a crosswalk table that shows exactly where the differences are between the two sets of standards, and that is available on the CCNE website. And if you are a chief nurse administrator or a CCNE on-site evaluator, you can also find um, that document in the CCNE online community. And that's actually true of all the documents that we'll be talking about today. We also developed a crosswalk table for the 2018 standards to the 2016 criteria for evaluation of nurse practitioner programs. This is only relevant if your institution prepares individuals as nurse practitioners. Additionally, you'll be able to find on the CCNE website or in the CCNE online community um, these are already available, the CCNE self-study template and the NTF criteria worksheet. Again, the um, worksheet only applies to those graduate programs that are preparing nurse practitioners. And the worksheet is specifically for the 2016 NTF criteria as that is the addition required in the 2018 standards. A new CIPR template and substantive change notification template are currently under development, and those will be available to you well in advance of when you'll need to use them um, for when the standards go into effect after the first of the year. As a reminder, um, it's important that you read the standard and each key element and its elaboration statement in its entirety. You may notice that there are often bullet points um, or perhaps a little alphabet underneath in the elaboration statement, a little A, B, C. Um, each of those items is important. Uh, so it's not a, a pick and choose kind of situation, but it's more that each of those items is intended to be addressed. So it's important that you um, make sure that you do so. So we're going to go ahead and get started and address standard three, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Pacini. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the, this slide just kind of provides us all with a summary or an overview of the changes that you're going to be seeing, and we will be providing more detail as we move through the webinar. But this is just sort of a table that um, uh, kind of summarizes all of that. Um, the probably, you know, for the what was key element 3A that remains the same, we simply added community of interest. You will see probably um, more logistically than substantively, key element 3B is now been broken up into four key elements, B, C, D, and E. And what we have done is we have unbundled the previous large, large key element 3B, and each program has, will, um, you know, has its own separate key element, and we'll talk about that more later. Key element 3C is now 3F, so you'll see renumbering. Um, there's some clarification there about the master's essentials in the DNP program, and again, we'll go into more detail. Um, key elements 3D and 3F are now combined into 3G and we'll provide more detail. Um, finally, um, key element 3E is now the new 3H, and um, we have included constructs related to interprofessional collaborative practice, and it does clarify requirements for program tracks that prepare students for a direct care role. So that's sort of a summary. Moving on, again, with the exception of key elements 3A and 3B, all of the key elements have been renumbered. Um, we have additional items for supporting documentation and additional clarifying language, and we have added language to the supporting documentation component 
of this uh, standard that provides more specificity and um, what hopefully will be more helpful to people in terms of preparing um, at, for expectations or what will be helpful for a smooth on-site visit. If you review standard three substantively, this standard really provides a program with, or you know, if you're submitting um, uh, different programs, but this standard really provides programs with the opportunity to showcase their curricula, innovative, creative, and evidence-based practices that they engage in, and it does speak to and allows you to showcase your unique mission goals, expected student outcomes, and community of interest, and how you frame your curriculum and how you go forward with that. So it's your opportunity to really tell your story and shine. With respect to key element 3A, essentially this is the same. If you look at the top bolded area of this slide, what we have done simply is kind of chopped up or broken up the previous uh, long narrative sentence and made it into some bullets. And then you will see that the third bullet, we've added this construct that we should also, when we uh, uh, write to this um, key element, identify how this program um, really uh, uh, meets the needs of the community of interest. And the elaboration statement is exactly the same as it was in the previous set of standards. With respect to 3B, um, 3B is a template here, and you will see now that 3B, 3C, 3D, and 3E are all what used to be 3B. And what has occurred is that we have taken that one ginormous um, key element and separated it out into four different key elements. And so the upside of that is if you are submitting a self-study report or you are um, having an on-site visit and maybe it's for just one program, maybe it's you're starting a new DNP program, you only have to address the standard that attends to the DNP program. And for the first time then, if you are not submitting a self-study uh, that addresses a baccalaureate, a master's, or a certificate program, or any of the above, you can actually have a not applicable option here. So that was done to provide clarity and to break things up so we have um, uh, a, a better understanding or a better ability to separate those things out. Um, if you look at uh, slide 16 here, um, oh, I'm sorry, you jumped ahead. Um, if you look at slide 16, slide 16 is the template of how all the other uh, slides go or how all the other, this addresses the baccalaureate curriculum. And so then you see all the information is there for the baccalaureate curriculum. Then if you go to slide 17, sorry, I made you go backwards. Here we have the information about the master's curricula. So here are all the information about the master's program, and that's where you would address that. If, for example, you have an RN to an MSN track, um, which is identified under um, graduate entry master's program, the bullet under little letter B there, remember that you're going to have to demonstrate that you have incorporated both the baccalaureate and the master's essentials into that entry level master's program. But if you have just a plain master's program where that is unique and um, uh, uh, contained, then you address the essentials um, as, we, as required. If you have a nurse practitioner track, you have to include the criteria for nurse practitioner programs easily or more readily known as the MTF criteria. Again, this key element is not applicable if you are not submitting a self-study or you are not seeking um, review of a master's program. If you go to slide 18, there's really not that much different on slide 18 at all in terms of the ongoing elaboration and expectation for master's programs. The um, content in the middle that talks about APR and education programs 
addresses the three P's, and that's really exactly the same as what we had prior in our prior set of standards. If you look at the bottom um, chunk down there, the master's degree programs that have a direct care focus but are not APRN education programs, and for example, the nurse educator track or the clinical nurse leader track, again, this is the same. They are required to incorporate graduate level content addressing the APRN core. However, for these tracks, it's not required that the three Ps necessarily are three separate courses. Again, it is up to the program to decide how they exactly want to operationalize that. When you move to uh, the next slide, 19, which is a key element 3D, again, you see this separated out for the DNP curriculum. And all of that is, um, uh, again, what was embedded in the previous ginormous 3B and again, the essentials of um, uh, um, the baccalaureate education program are required if you have um, a DNP entry program. Um, uh, so <clears throat> if you go on, and again, if you don't have a DNP program or you're not using, um, you're not submitting for that, uh, you do not, this can be checked off as not applicable. But this is all exactly the same that we carried over from the previous, um, previous standards. If you go to slide 20, again, you see the same iteration that if your DNP program is a APRN focused program, the statement around the three Ps and the requirements for the three Ps are identified there and um, separate courses in advanced physiology, um, patho, and advanced health assessment are not required, again, for post-master's DNP programs where people are already certified unless the program decides that's what it wants to do. So again, the onus is upon the program to tell us their story about how they're crafting their curriculum. If you go to um, key element 3E, which is slide 21, here we have separated out the postgraduate APRN certificate program. And this language is the same. If you're not submitting an APRN, postgraduate APRN certificate program for review, um, this would be a not applicable. However, it is very important that if you have a postgraduate APRN certificate program, you must address this key element specifically even if it's in alignment with a, a, a master's program or a DNP program that you already have in place. This is considered a separate program and must be addressed in terms of what you're doing with the curriculum for that certificate program. If you go to slide 22. Chris, um, before, Chris, before yes, we move on ahead. to slide 22, I just, sure. um, um, I, I, I think it's worth just uh, having a little bit more conversation related to this. Um, as you know, CCNE started accrediting postgraduate APR and certificate programs um, when the current standards went into effect January 1st, 2014. Prior to January 1st, 2014, CCNE did not review for accreditation postgraduate APR and certificate program. And there have been a number of um, accredited programs that were under the misimpression that because their um, postgraduate APR and certificate programs aligned with their master's or their DNP programs, that those certificate programs were already accredited. Um, which was not accurate. And there has also been some confusion, as you know, over the last few years with the implementation of the new standards that programs did not understand that they needed to address the postgraduate APR and certificate program separately in their self-study document um, because of the alignment at their particular institution with the, the graduate um, offering. So really, I just wanted to step in here and, and reiterate that 
if you offer a postgraduate APR and certificate program and you are seeking accreditation of that program, you need to address key element 3E. Thank you, I'm Lori. Done. You're welcome. That was my little lecture for the day. Okay. Um, Lori lectures us all the time and we really appreciate it. It's very helpful. Um, if you go to if you go to slide 22, then again, this is an APRN um, post uh, degree APRN postgraduate APRN program, a certificate program. So the um, language around the three P's is spelled out again, and um, core content specific to the role and population isn't integrated as it would be in other role or population focused um, courses. Um, so again, it is the onus of the organization to decide if they want to uh, readdress or have students in a certificate program redo the three Ps or if they accept the three Ps from their previous um, uh, degree program, that's, that is the purview of the organization to establish those um, standards. Having said that, evidence still has to be um, clear that people are meeting the criteria of um, the, the three Ps. So um, when you look at slide 23, this is just a reminder at, at sort of a summary of these first uh, key elements. You know, if a, if a program offers an RN to MSN pre, uh, track, then the program needs to incorporate both the baccalaureate and the master's essentials. Um, you're not awarding a baccalaureate degree, but you have to demonstrate that students are achieving those competencies um, and those expectations embedded in those, both sets of those essentials. Um, likewise, if a program offers a BSN to DNP pathway and awards a master's degree along the way, then the program needs to demonstrate incorporation of both the master's and the doctoral essentials. If a program allows students enrolled in a BSN to DNP program to stop out and awards a master's degree, that program needs to demonstrate that they have incorporated the master's and the doctoral essentials. If a program offers a BSN to DNP pathway but does not offer a master's degree along the way or does not allow students to stop out, the program then only needs to demonstrate incorporation of the doctoral essentials. And then finally, if a program offers an MSN to DNP pathway or post-master's DNP, they only need to demonstrate incorporation of the doctoral essentials. So these reminders are just there to help sort of um, specify expectations and how programs need to address and take up the essentials as they create their um, uh, curricular plan. And now I'm going to turn it over to Deborah. All right. So if you, if you read through 3F, you will see that uh, it, it is the old 3C. So this key element, 3F, focuses specifically on the structure of the curriculum and want, it looks at the foundation for each degree program or certificate level and then it ties that um, degree program back to the relevant um, essentials. So are the, are the NTF criteria, the curriculum back to the, the appropriate essentials or NTF criteria. So you will notice that um, the key element itself is stated in the same words as the prior old 3C. And when you get to the elaboration, uh, on this particular slide you see the elaboration for the BSN program. It's the same concept. The only difference is uh, we use the term graduate in the second sentence, graduate entry programs, rather than post-baccalaureate entry programs, just for a little bit of clarity. So in addressing this key element, we would expect uh, programs to demonstrate that they have incorporated the arts and sciences and humanities um, into their baccalaureate program, and they're using that as a foundation for the, for the nursing um, practice experiences and knowledge level for their students. And then we'll go on to the next slide. 
and what's expected for graduate programs to do. This is, again, this is um, the first part of that is, is really not new, that graduate programs provide evidence that they are based on a foundation comparable to a BSN degree. And if a program is offering an RN to MSN, that is they're moving associate degree or diploma nurses to the master's level, or if a program admits uh, undergraduate nurse admits a undergraduate student to these programs that doesn't have a nursing degree, then the, then the programs need to show how students acquire the knowledge and competencies comparable to the BSN. And there is a new requirement. Um, there is a new requirement for the DMP programs. So programs are still expected to demonstrate how students acquire doctoral level competencies and knowledge level based on the essentials of doctoral education for advanced practice nursing. But if the program awards a master's degree as part of that DMP program, then the program needs to demonstrate how students acquire master's level knowledge and competencies as delineated in the master's education in nursing. Deborah, before and it applicable to for evaluation. Um, Deborah, before we move on, you know, I think that it, it's worth um, perhaps just elaborating um, that regardless of the degree being offered, the awarded, excuse me, that the onus is always on the program to be able to demonstrate that students have achieved all of the appropriate degree level competencies and that if they're coming into the program without the prior degree, you know, for instance, when you were talking about graduate entry, that the, program, the onus is on the program to be able to demonstrate that the student has um, achieved the knowledge that one would expect um, at, at both of those degree levels, for instance, if it were an um, entry to practice master's program. Is, is that an accurate way to state that? Yes, yeah, that's right. And then the very, last, the very last sentence here just clarifies that the program provides a rationale for the sequence of the curriculum for each one of their programs, if, they're, if, if that's up for accreditation. So that sentence was sort of tagged in with the DNP program, so it looked like um, it was only talking about the DNP program. So that makes it a little bit clearer that uh, a rationale for the sequence if the baccalaureate is being uh, up for accreditation, that you would want to provide that information. Thank so now let's see what 3G. So 3G, it, it, this key, new key element combines what we had in uh, 3D, which was teaching and learning practices in the 2013 uh, standard. And in 3F, which is teaching and learning practices considered the needs of the communities of interest. So if you look at the uh, key elements itself, then the first bullet point comes from 3D. The second bullet com point comes from the old 3F. And the third bullet point is going to be new. So, so for this key element, programs have an opportunity to discuss and present, and present examples of ways that their teaching learning practices are supporting the achievement of student outcomes. And they, can, they need to talk about uh, why they think that those are appropriate for their particular student population, their community of interest, and new that, that, that is added to this uh, key element is that the teaching learning practices are broadening student perspectives of, of individuals with diverse life experiences, perspectives, and backgrounds. So again, schools are going to need to add to their discussion what they're doing into, in their program, whether it's real or virtual classroom experiences, clinical experiences, but it, what are they doing to expose students to diverse patient populations? And, um, there are lots of different ways that uh, this can be achieved, and CC isn't prescribing the way to do it, 
but um, but there are, with the understanding that there are lots of ways to do it, but uh, what are schools doing to expose students to practice in an environment when they graduate where they will have to take care of individuals with very diverse life experiences, perspectives, and backgrounds. So we'll move on to 3H. 3H is the old uh, 3E in our 2013. And uh, if you will see the um, key element itself, there is one new area, and that is the second bullet, fosters interprofessional collaborative practice. That part is new. So in this key element, uh, what schools are going to be doing and what the program evaluators will be writing to is um, how clinical practice experience tie back to helping students integrate new knowledge as they attain their program goals. And again, the, the new uh, area for foster interprofessional practice, which really relates to the whole um, idea of preparing students to function as part of the interprofessional team upon graduation. And again, we recognize that there are many ways that schools can achieve this confidence in students and CCNE doesn't prescribe one particular way to do it, but this is an opportunity for a student, uh, for schools to describe how in their curriculum they are preparing students to function as a member of an interprofessional team uh, upon graduation. For programs, I'll call your attention to um, paragraph, the paragraph two under the elaboration, which is a clarification that uh, programs which have a direct care focus, which includes post-licensure -bac post baccalaureate or RN to BSN or RN to MSN programs and nurse educator track, provide that those programs need to provide direct care experiences designed to advance the knowledge and expertise of students in a clinical area of practice. So schools need to talk about for, for these tracks uh, that are considered direct care, and this is an area that uh, sometimes uh, schools tended to uh, either omit or didn't give enough uh, clarity around these areas for, um, for the board to make a decision. And Deborah, before so we'll move we go, um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to ask a question um, before we move on. So, Deborah, we, we frequently get asked if it's okay for students to do their clinical practice experiences um, in their place of employment. Can, can you speak to that for a minute or two? I think that um, people, students can do their practice experiences in their place of employment. And CCNE doesn't have any, any statements that say that that's not acceptable. I think it depends on the particular situation. If a, if a student in their place of employment can function in that student role where they are trying to uh, integrate new knowledge into practice and they have appropriate mentorship, the, the, their employment agency is allowing them to do that. So I think there's a lot of factors that a, that a faculty would want or a school would want to consider as to whether that's an appropriate experience or not. I think certainly if you have someone in their uh, own clinical practice who is in a particular role and they're not allowed to expand beyond that role, they don't have the support of the institution to really try to acquire the new knowledge level, then, then that's probably not going to be an experience that allows students to achieve the expected uh, outcome. I appreciate that. So, Oh, I'm sorry, this is Chris, and I just wanted to pipe in and say I think the, the, the issue is not where as much as demonstrating that the direct care clinical learning experience will advance the level of knowledge and expertise of students with respect to the degree that they are seeking or attaining. Thank you. So if I hear what both of you are saying, I, I, it's okay that a clinical practice situation might be in a, 
in a student's place of employment, but it can't be business as usual. It, it's not them continuing to do what they've been doing. They just happen to have the opportunity to have um, a clinical practice experience that's aligned to the expected student and program outcomes that happens to be in their place of employment. That's correct. Because yeah. their, their place of employment, their place of employment may be the ultimate place to learn this new knowledge and have an opportunity to apply that. Uh, so again, it, it's not business as usual. It, uh, it, is this a place that's going to facilitate the student being able to accomplish the goals of the curriculum? Um, so. And just be before we move on to the next slide, um, this, this new language that was added, that the statement programs that have a direct care focus, um, and then we have the parenthetical, including but not limited to post-licensure baccalaureate and nurse educator tracks. Um, just to clarify here, these are specifically considered direct care roles. Therefore, CCNE would always have the expectation that students who were enrolled in these programs would have the opportunity for direct care clinical experiences. Is that accurate? Yes, that's very accurate. Terrific. Okay. I'll stop interrupting and we'll go ahead and move on because we're going to talk about it again in this slide. So uh, this definition of direct care comes directly from the master's essentials. And uh, clinical, and we all know that uh, clinical practice experience can be direct care or they could be indirect care. But if a student's being prepared for a direct care role, and some examples of the direct care role is uh, our baccalaureate graduates are being prepared for a, a direct care role, and that's whether they are a pre-licensure student or they're a, a post-licensure student, such as an RN to BSN student. Nurse educator students are considered direct care, a direct care role. Nurse practitioner is a direct care role. Clinical nurse specialist is a direct care role. Clinical nurse leader are considered direct care roles. So all of those students in all of those tracks need to have clinical experiences as part of their curriculum where they are able to provide nursing care to individuals and families to help those people achieve specific health goals and uh, selected health outcomes. And direct care can occur in a wide range of settings. It might be an acute care hospital. It might be uh, it might be in a community-based setting. It might be in, a, in a, a school, a public school system setting or some other educational setting. So there's a variety of ways, uh, depending on uh, the uh, objectives of the curriculum and the, and the uh, competencies that the school is trying to develop in their students that uh, you might have design those direct care experiences. So the next slide, uh, gives you a little bit of perspective on, well, if that's direct care, so what is indirect care? And you will notice again that uh, this definition is, is, is in the master's essentials. And um, indirect care roles, we typically think of uh, students that are in nursing administration tracks or informatics tracks or leadership tracks as providing indirect care. And indirect care is provided through or on behalf of individuals, families, or groups. So nurses in, a, in indirect care um, clinical experiences are going to provide students an opportunity to work through other people or on behalf of other people to help them achieve uh, their health care outcomes. So our next slide is just to, to tell you again that those definitions that we talked about came from the master's essentials, but the, the definitions are consistent with the language that you will find in the AAC and baccalaureate essentials, the doctoral essentials. It's also consistent with what you will find uh, in the AAC and white paper, which address the expectation of the practice experiences for RN to BSN students in a curriculum and the AAC in white paper that address the doctor of nursing practice, 
current issues and clarifying recommendations. So those are some, uh, some other resources for people as you look at, well, what constitutes direct care or indirect, indirect care. So the next slide gives you a little bit more information about um, uh, direct care ex experiences. And certainly the list that you see here is not an exhaustive list. And, you know, most programs really are, prov are providing adequate direct care experiences for their students. But what we have found is that some programs really don't tell their stories well. And then sometimes uh, visitors to a school may not tell the story for the school very well. So this is an area that I think that um, people really need to focus on is really telling telling in your self-study report, what are you doing that constitute direct care experiences that's appropriate for your baccalaureate students and um, in, in all tracks within your program. So we'll go on to the next slide. So here are just some examples of clinical assignments for students that are indirect care activities. And the reason that these are not direct care activities is because there's not really, there's not an implementation phase where, where students are working with real people, if, if you will. So doing a public poster presentation in a library in and of itself is not considered direct care. Now, a poster presentation might be part of a uh, direct care assignment, but it would have to, but the direct care assignment to meet that definition, it would have to go beyond uh, just doing a poster presentation. Skills lab practicing clinical skills is not direct care. Looking at virtual simula simulated or standardized patients is considered indirect care. And window survey, if, if students in a classroom do window surveys and that's all they do, then that's not an example of direct care. But if, if an assignment had students go, go out into the community, do a window shield survey, come back and analyze the data, and then intervene in some way with the community to address healthcare needs, then it becomes part of a whole package, if you will, of clinical experience that could be categorized as a direct care experience. So again, I think as schools look at what they're doing for direct care or indirect care, if they want more direct care experiences, it may be a way to take what they're doing in indirect care areas and uh, taking those activities one step further so that uh, students do have an experience trying to implement some of the findings and some of their plans to improve healthcare outcomes for that particular patient or that particular uh, population. Now, there is a lot of value to direct care experiences. There are a lot of value to indirect care uh, experiences. It just depends on it needs whatever kind of experience you have needs to align with uh, what part of your curriculum or what goal that you were you are trying to um, to attain. So there's again value in both types of activities. One is not better than the other, but they are very different and. Um, Within the uh, key elements, you need to, as schools need to discuss what are they doing that are, that's direct care. What might they be doing that is um, indirect care? And we will go on to the next slide. So let's move to the master's level and talk about, in particular, uh, what should the focus of the clinical practice experience for master's degree students enrolled in a nurse educator track look like. So nurse educator programs must include clinical practice experiences for students that provide the students an opportunity to develop an in-depth knowledge and expertise in a particular area of nursing practice that includes graduate level clinical practice content and experiences. And the reason this is necessary is because students need in-depth preparation in an area of nursing practice so that they can teach, they're prepared to teach their students. 
and they need this information. This information needs to be above his or her entry level preparation in order for them to be an effective teacher. So, and as you know, um, teaching students in a clinical setting or teaching students in a classroom is not considered uh, a direct care experience for these particular uh, nurse educator students. So we will go on to slide 34, which is sort of a, a recap. Um, the area of expertise or clinical practice area, again, is if you look at if you look at bullet point number one, um, clinical practice experience for nurse educator students are designed to provide expertise in a particular area of clinical nursing practice. Well, CCNE doesn't prescribe uh, the area of clinical practice, and but clearly the area of clinical practice has to be more than teaching students or solely education. The graduate level clinical practice experiences should provide graduate level clinical practice content and the purpose is so that the student can develop, develop knowledge and skill to teach beyond their own entry level of preparation. All right, so we will go on to slide 35, which um, here are some examples of direct care experiences for nurse educator students to gain in-depth preparation in the area of nursing practice beyond what they learned as part of their entry-level program. And their direct care experiences might occur um, in any of these situations or any of these um, uh, areas, and this is not, again, an exhaustive list. list. There may be some other things. So the direct care experiences may occur in a medical surgical setting, in acute care, in community care, maybe critical care, maybe palliative care. But again, there can be a variety of healthcare settings where students are engaging with individuals to improve their health outcomes. It's also appropriate uh, as a direct care experience for students that are nurse educator students to participate in community outreach activities. And there's an example there of, of uh, working with a mobile health clinic, maybe doing a, um, uh, a health fair within the community. It is appropriate, appropriate assignment that the students are providing patient education to patients and families. And it's also appropriate that they might be implementing community-based projects where, again, what the focus of that is, is they're trying to move to the next level of nursing care and trying to um, make changes in patient care or a change in a system and organization or unit level uh, uh, changes. Quality evidence-based applications would be uh, sort of an example of that. The next slide, so here are some examples that are not direct care. 100% simulation, so just like when we talked about prior with the undergraduate students, uh, baccalaureate students, 100% simulation is not direct care. Teaching students or working with faculty who are supervising students, either in the classroom or a clinical setting, is not direct care. Participating in staff development activities where you're really teaching staff in a hospital or staff in a community agency. Again, that, that's a very important skill set for a nurse educator student, but it's not direct care. And then didactic content. We know that nurse educator programs have to have an APRN core, which uh, comprises the three Ps, whether that's three separate courses or it's integrated into one or two courses or more courses, that's required. And But the participation in those didactic courses is not considered um, direct care. So, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, um, Deborah or Chris, um, if you could just clarify, um, I believe this is accurate, but I always like to go to the experts, um, and that's the CCNE does not require, and it's, it's not stated in, in the standards or key elements, um, 
that there are a certain number of hours of clinical practice required, nor is there um, a description that, you know, for instance, a certain number of hours need to be direct care and then a certain number of hours need to be indirect care. Um, can you give some examples of how a program might make some decisions as to um, how much time, and I don't mean for you to give specific hours, but you know, how decisions could be made uh, related to direct care experiences and indirect care experiences. I presume that these are directly related to the expected student outcomes and the, the program outcomes? It, yeah, exactly. And, and again, we're talking about nurse educator students here. We're not talking about uh, advanced practice students, uh, nurse practitioners, clin spec that have a required number of hours as per the NTF criteria. But uh, again, you know, how a, how a school decides to structure their curriculum is up to the school. The onus is on the school to include direct care experiences because again, the whole goal is to get an individual who wants to be a nurse educator who really has a level of knowledge in a, um, nursing practice area that's above knowledge that they had when they graduated from their baccalaureate degree, for example. So how a school does that um, really is it's on the onus of the school to provide the rationale or the evidence that in fact what they have structured is appropriate for their students to attain, to attain those competencies. And I think that um, as schools are designing those experiences, they're also going to be designing evaluation methods so that they can, so that they can um, demonstrate that, in fact, we have met the goals that we needed to meet as per the master's essentials um, in, in, these, uh, in this uh, nurse educator group of students. So there isn't there isn't a um, any uh, prescribed way to do it, and there are lots of different ways that quality schools that offer nursing education programs do do uh, accomplish this goal. And so I think that uh, um, I would encourage people to look at other schools and what they're doing, and that you won't necessarily have to recreate the wheel, but. Um, um, certainly, you need some, some opportunities for students to gather advanced knowledge in an area of nursing practice and an opportunity to practice in a direct care role where they can integrate that new knowledge. So, for example, with the three Ps, uh, students are taking advanced farm, advanced patho, advanced uh, health assessment. So what opportunity do students have that maybe they are integrating their advanced patho knowledge in a clinical setting with real people? How are they, go, how are, how are they helping people go to that next level? And that just makes, uh, I think the whole uh, concept behind it is it makes it for a better faculty member uh, who, has, who has that knowledge base when they're working with their students. And I hope that um, answers Sort of answers the question. Lori, Thank you Lori for that. This, is, this, this is Chris. Could I just, uh, you know, and I don't want you to flip back to slide 14, but I just keep going back to what the standard is all about. And the standard is all about that the curriculum is developed in accordance with the unique mission, goals, and expected student outcomes and is attentive to the community of interest and utilizes and embeds the uh, standards and guidelines, the required standards and guidelines. And so it is really, every organization is very unique, it's very contextual, and we have seen hundreds of different ways to address this. And my only contribution here is showcase what you're doing, be clear, be specific, be proud, you know what I mean? And really utilize this standard and these key elements to tell your story about how you are really moving people 
to achieve your ALK. Thank you, thank you both. Um, I think that that's very helpful, that the additional detail um, provided Deborah was very helpful. And Chris, I think um, refocusing um, our participants on the, the purpose of the standard was, was also very helpful and helped um, you know, hone in on, on the discussion. We want to make sure we get through all our slides, so we'll go ahead and get to key element 3i. Okay, 3i is the old 3G, so there's nothing new here, and this element addresses evaluation for students, and um, you can see in the elaboration, you could bullet those out, the evaluation procedures need to be consistent with what your expected student outcomes are, your grade criteria needs to be communicated, consistently applied, your evaluation findings are communicated to the students, and I think importantly, and this is not new either, that faculty retain responsibility for evaluating students. So, for example, lots of schools nowadays use preceptors, and uh, precept, use of preceptors is fine, but again, faculty have to maintain the, um, the responsibility for evaluating their students. They seek input for, from preceptors, but they don't turn the evaluation responsibility totally over to preceptors. The faculty have to retain that. And uh, this, so for this key element, uh, schools are want to, will want to describe how they are meeting all these expectations. And then for 3J, this is the old 3H, and there are just a few changes, minor changes in the elaboration statement. So, for example, in the old 3H, it stated that the faculty and other, you're looking at, uh, the faculty and other communities of interest as appropriate evaluate the curriculum and teaching learning practices. Well, the first sentence of the revised elaboration specifies that the faculty use data from faculty and student evaluations of teaching learning practices. And certainly a, a program may want to use information from other communities of interest. But uh, the key element now requires that you show us how you're using data from faculty and student evaluations of teaching to uh, inform your curricula and foster ongoing improvement. And I think that's my set, and I will turn it back over to Chris. Let me get off, let me get off a mute here. Okay, in terms of supporting documentation, the Standards Committee really um, examined this and really tried to enhance and provide more specificity and increased detail and increased clarity to help um, programs be um, uh, prepared uh, for on-site evaluation. So you see, previously I think we had seven or eight supporting exa uh, examples of supporting documentation, now we have 14. But, so if you look at uh, the first one, the only thing I want to say about number one, evidence that faculty participate in the development, implementation, and revision of the curriculum. Um, often, you know, minutes are the methodology and are identified as being a helpful resource. And it's a common example that many schools use. But there might be other forms of evidence or documentation that programs have to really demonstrate that faculty are engaged and involved with the development, implementation, and revision of curriculum. Um, number two is the old number, actually number one is the old number seven, number two is the old number one, and course syllabi, the expectation is that all syllabi for all courses that are under that particular review be available to the site visitors. We do not dictate or mandate that they're in paper form or electronic or whatever. There's no prescription about that, but the, the, the visitors um, really need access to that. Number three is the no, old number eight, you know, examples of course content or uh, uh, assignments. Number four is kind of new. Um, evidence of that APRN education programs incorporate separate comprehensive graduate courses to address the APRN course. So please provide your visitors and incorporate in your report, um, you know, uh, well, provide visitors 
examples of, you know, the syllabi for the three separate P courses for APRN uh, education programs. Number five is kind of new and more specific, um, that where you have a direct care focus for non-APRN uh, programs, uh, nurse educator and clinical nurse leader, for example, that you provide evidence about how those three Ps are either provided, some programs do three separate courses for those tracks. Other programs have integrated courses for that track. We don't care, we're not prescribing that, but make sure that the evidence is there that the core is provided to those tracks, for example. Six is again kind of new. Um, we, it's very helpful to the site visitors, and I've been a team leader, to have a, a um, it doesn't have to be a grid, it doesn't have to be a chart, but that there's some kind of curricular plan or program of study for each track and each program that's under review. So for example, if you have a baccalaureate program with you know, a traditional track, an RN to BSN track, and a accelerated second degree track, Three, you know, those three curricular plans should be available to the site visitors so that they can connect the syllabi that you provide with the track and, uh, and accumulate and acquire the evidence because they want to rep your, represent your programs really well. Seven is the old number two, examples of student work. This is very helpful in terms of seeing how students are realizing your uh, expected learning outcomes. Um, number eight is a little more new. Uh, give us examples. Be very, be very clear about the clinical practice experiences that prepare students for interprofessional collaborative practice. There's no prescription for that. But again, the goal is how are students going to demonstrate competency in working once they graduate from whatever level they're at with respect to interprofessional competencies. Uh, number nine is kind of a new one. Direct care clinical experiences for all programs or tracks who prepare students for a direct role. Again, uh, Deborah, I'm not gonna go over this, but, uh, I thought did an outstanding job articulating this, but be very clear. Tell us what you're doing. Don't be shy. The, the board, the, R, the accreditation review committee, the team leaders, Everyone really wants to have a full understanding of that. A uh, number two uh, is Chris, the if I could, I'm sorry, Chris, I'm if sorry. I could just jump in for one minute. Um, yes. I, just want oh, to, uh, I, I just want to make a statement. You, you just indicated that number nine was new, and I just wanted to clarify for our, our program participants that the addition of this to the list and supporting documentation is new, but the required right, right. Is not new. Exactly. Um, I, um, and I also just wanted to say that we know that we're a few minutes over. We're hoping that you can stay with us. If you can't, we understand, but the webinar will be archived. So I'm going to go ahead and let Chris finish up here, but um, I just wanted to make that one clarification. Thank you. You're exactly right, Lori. I was only speaking to what was new to the list in the old standards. You are exactly right. Um, affiliation agreements, that's uh, ongoing. Number 11 is ongoing in terms of student performance evaluations on slide 41. Documentation that faculty are responsible for grading. Deborah spoke to that already. Examples of tools for curriculum assessment and 14 documents that demonstrate student, those, though they're not new expectations, they have been specified and spelled out as new examples or new um, expectations for um, uh, supporting documentation. So, Lori, I'm going to let you tie this up. I'm sorry I made us go over. No need to apologize, Chris. You were sharing important information, and I know that everyone that's been participating in the webinar appreciates that. Um, just as a reminder, the final pre-publication version of the 2018 standards is currently available on the CCNE website. It's also the CCNE online community for chief nurse administrators and evaluators. We're only calling it pre-publication because it is not the version that has been sent to the printers, but it is the final version of the standards. 
We have additional resources available to all of you. As always, we have the procedures for accreditation. We have an overview of the CCNE accreditation process, which really gives um, a more micro look at each part of each step in the process. We have um, a general advice document for programs that are hosting an on-site evaluation, and of course, all the professional nursing standards and guidelines that are required by CCNE, such as the essentials and NTF criteria, are also available on those two websites. Please join us next uh, week, August 29th, um, where we discuss the final of the four standards, standard four. And that webinar is scheduled for 90 minutes as opposed to 60. And if you have any questions about the standards or the accreditation process, please contact myself or my colleague, Lena Trelliger, Associate Director, and her contact information is here. So I'm sure everyone joins me in thanking um, Deborah Davis and Chris Cassini for their expertise this afternoon, and I'm going to turn it back over to Sean. All right, thank you. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you again to our speakers, and thank you to our audience for joining us this afternoon. On your screen in the chat box, you will see a link to the evaluation form. If you'd like to complete, that, complete it at this time, click on the link in your chat box. If you do not have time now, a link will be emailed to live attendees. At the end of the evaluation, there will be a link for you to click and download your contact hour certificate, which you can sign and print for your record. Thank you all again and have a wonderful day.